It's Support the Troops Week here in Wilmington, Ohio. Plus, it's homecoming weekend for Wilmington's Fightin' Quakers. And don't forget the big county corn festival is just around the corner. If this is any indication of how Mr. Trump's going to do, it's going to be a landslide for Trump. Also a reminder about that big Wilmington Gun Festival, which is going to be held at the Roberts Center at the end of the month. You want to see my 357? A lot of people say that Trump is a clown. He won't be when he's president. Around here, I ain't heard nobody for Clinton. And speaking of guns and the people who want to take them away from us, controversial filmmaker Michael Moore will perform a one-man show tonight at the Murphy Theater. Trump lost $914 million, but he got out of a lot of taxes for that, too, so that's probably just a good idea. You know, he didn't get it handed down to him like Hillary did from her parents. Ohio Republicans have tried to block Moore from performing in the state, with one local leader threatening to cut public funds for the theater if the show goes on. I think it's going to be close, and I think that Hillary's going to have dead people vote. <laughs> There's no word from the theater's benefactor, conservative icon Glenn Beck, where he stands on the issue. Michael Moore needs to go a little We put the word out. We wanted all types of people to come here tonight. We have anybody here who's thinking about voting for Donald Trump. Good, thank you, welcome. And how many people here are voting for Hillary? Wow. So we've got a good mix here tonight. Trump voters, we've got Hillary voters, we've got people who aren't sure who they're gonna vote for, we've got people who aren't gonna vote at all. How about third party people? Anybody voting for a third party candidate? Can I ask you where Aleppo is? Just kidding, just kidding. The only thing you need to know about Wilmington, it's the birthplace of the banana split. How about that, huh? Hold the nuts. <laughs> well, Wilmington, uh, Ohio here is the county seat of Clinton County, Ohio. <laughs> the irony was not lost on me probably from the first minute I entered this town. It may be called Clinton County, but it's not Clinton country. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Trump got four times as many votes here than Hillary did in the primary. Right? I mean, I think in part it's because the people who are more conservative, Republicans, Trump voters, whatever, <laughs> it's something I actually admire about conservatives. You have the courage of your convictions. You are relentless. You're like, this is the way I believe. Damn it, that's it. And we're like, well, I, I don't know. I could think about it a little bit and maybe. <laughs> you know, these Trump voters, my friends, are going to be up five in the morning on election day. They're up at five in the morning a lot. The only time we see five in the morning is when we've been up partying all night. That's, that's five in the morning. Yeah, right. Come on, everybody in here has got a conservative in the family. Right? Many of you brought that person with you here tonight. A brother, a father, an uncle, a brother-in-law, a sister. Not a sister, I know. I just threw that in there. <laughs> and they are the organized one in the family. They never lose their car keys. The conservative, they've got little hooks in the, right the back door with a label on each hook. That's my Beamer key. That's my F-150 key. That's the key for the car Matthew McConaughey drives. <laughs> Our side, we're like, <laughs> this, is how we, this is how we sound. This is how we sound. So uh, where, where do you want to go eat tonight? I don't care. Where do you want to go? I don't know. Wherever you want to go. No, 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 no. You pick last time. No, I, seriously, wherever you want. This is right. This is like the conservative. They're like, get in the car. We're going to Outback. Get in there. Decisive. Organized. Discipline. You've got to admire that about them. <laughs> no, but all kidding aside, as it says out on the marquee, Trump voters welcome here tonight. And I really wanted to invite people who are thinking of voting for Donald Trump.
might be leaning toward Trump. So I just want to so as a gesture of goodwill to those of you who are thinking of voting for Donald Trump uh, tonight, uh, I've, I've done something to make you comfortable in here amongst these uh, liberals and Bernie voters and third party people and undecideds and whatever. And, and on the way in, you might have noticed the ushers um, uh, asked uh, Mexicans or, um, and Mexican-Americans who were coming in uh, if they would sit in a special Mexican section. We've, we've segregated them out uh, for you. Where, oh, there you are, over there. We've got, we gave them their own little... What? <laughs> she said she's from Guatemala. Close enough. Close. close. It's, it's just so the Trump people wouldn't be nervous, we made it Mexican or Mexican-looking. All right? And during the show tonight... Um, our production assistants will be building a symbolic wall around them in the balcony. <laughs> Don't worry, you'll be able to get out. You will have to pay to get out of the wall at the end of the show. And as an added gesture, uh, we, have, we have placed any person that was Muslim or Muslim-looking in their own section here. Uh, in the, are the Muslims up there? Here we go, Muslims. There they are. Muslim, Muslim Americans, right? Let's hear it for them. They're Americans. But just so, just so that the Trump people aren't too nervous about you being in here, uh, we are going to fly a drone above them right within the theater here. There's no weapons on the drone. We're nonviolent, just cameras. So we'll be able to know, you know, just, just check in on you to see how you're doing when, what you're up to. Now, see, I see the shoulders of the, the Trump guy back there. He's already relaxed. So, see, we've got it covered for you. That's what I was willing to do so that you would come here tonight. Um, I'll tell you one thing, if this eases your mind at all. Um, I have never voted for Hillary Clinton. I voted for Obama in the primary in 2008, and I voted for uh, uh, Bernie in the primary this year. I, actually, I never voted for Bill. Uh, I, you know, back then, I... I I think I voted for Nader in 96, and 92 was probably a third-party thing because Clinton was just too... He was a very conservative Democrat. So I've never really voted for Hillary. I am not a Hillary voter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you, and thank you. You can applaud that. You know, we're all Americans, right? Let's just start there, regardless who we're voting for, right? We're all in the same boat, and we're going to sink or swim together. And I'd rather we swim... Because I believe we have more things in common than not. We, we believe in the same things. First of all, we want the best schools for our kids, right? Trump voters, right? Right? You want the best schools for your kids. That's not... I know, I know there's a rule, don't agree with Michael Moore on anything. But <laughs> I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to come out and meet you halfway. And the things we don't agree on, all right? You love your guns. I don't want a gun, I don't get a gun. I won't get one. You don't believe in abortion. Okay, sir, do not have an abortion. <laughs> don't, if you are against it, don't get one. <laughs> Who doesn't like the Supreme Court's decision on gay marriage in here? You don't, you don't support it, right, right? Anybody else back there? Sir? Okay, sir, then don't get gay married. <laughs> right? It's like if, if, if two gay people want to get married, let them be married. You don't want to be gay. And trust me, you won't like it. All right. It won't, it won't feel good. It won't look good. I'm convinced it will end up in gay divorce, which isn't even legal yet. They only legalize gay marriage. They forgot to legalize gay divorce. I don't even know what that looks like. So I met one of the five Democrats in town, uh, and he comes up to me and he, he, yesterday and he goes, Mike, Mike, we got to do something about the millennials. You know, they're not, they're not going to vote. They're not voting. They're, they're, what are we going to do about the millennials? And I said, well, nothing. <laughs> the, we already did something. We raised them. <laughs> what, that, was a, that was a lot. We raised this generation. My generation did, right? We raised you, those of you who are millennials in here. You turned out, I think, pretty good. I think your generation is... Yes! You're, you're, you're smart. 
you come over and change the ink cartridges for us in our printers? <laughs> when, we, when we can't get our device to work, we call you up and you explain to us how to turn it off, then turn it back on, <laughs> and it magically works again every time? And you're not haters. This is a generation of non-haters. Have you noticed that? I mean, really, the majority... The majority of, of, of 18 to 35-year-olds are, you know, they don't hate people because of their skin color or because they're in love with someone of their same gender. I don't see it, and it makes me feel really good that we did something right. Um, but So I said to this guy, I said, really, I don't, I don't think it's on us to do something about them because they didn't create climate change. They didn't send the troops to Iraq. You know, millennials didn't cause the Wall Street collapse. Why is it on them to fix our shitty situation that we've handed them? I mean, seriously. I mean, I've, I mean, there's something about when you're that age and you're rebellious, and I want you to be that way. I don't want you compromising. You've got plenty of time in the real world to compromise. The rest of your life, you'll have plenty of time to compromise and be in some shitty job that you can't stand. You know, to, to be in, in some loveless marriage. <laughs> Why be that way at 19? Just don't compromise. But also understand too that sometimes, sometimes we have to take some medicine to get better. And uh, taking medicine isn't really a compromise. It's a smart thing to do. So you'll know, you'll know what to do. It's not the kids I'm worried about. The kids are all right. <laughs> it's, the, it's the angry white guy. His days are numbered. Total number of white guys over the age of 35 now in the United States, 19%. That's all we are, guys. Now, hey! Hey, what? They're cheering our demise. <laughs> our extinction. That's what's going on here. You know that, right? We know it. We guys know it. We know it's over for us. We had a good run. 10,000 years wasn't bad, right, guys? <laughs> right? It was... And now here we are in the 21st century. For the first time ever, there are now more single women than married women. Are you aware of this? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> see here. See that, guys? Yeah. Yeah. Because they don't need us. <laughs> they can be single now. A hundred years ago, they couldn't be single. We had laws that wouldn't allow them to own property or have a bank account or get divorced. Right? They couldn't sue in court. There were all these laws. You... Check this out. If you don't know this, there were a long list of laws that prohibited women from doing the basic things that somebody should be able to do. But now they don't need us. So we used to be useful for something, right? Well we're, well, we're needed to keep the species going. That was our most important job. Uh, what else are we good for? Getting something off the top shelf. <laughs> Except now, they've invented in vitro fertilization and the portable aluminum stepladder. <laughs> you don't need us. You don't need us for orgasms anymore. <laughs> Guys, you know they don't need us for that, right? Somebody put out a book like 30 years ago, Our Bodies Ourselves, taught women things that God knows they shouldn't have been taught. <laughs> if Hillary wins, if the women take over, and because they don't need us, so you know what this is going to lead to? They're going to be internment camps for men. <laughs> and Hillary will have all her, you know, Wellesley students there with their clipboards, checking us in to the internment camp. They got to they gotta pick out a few to keep the species going. Who are they going to pick? The smart ones and the good-looking ones. So, all right, already I'm looking at the faces of the guys here. They, they already know they're in the camp. <laughs> We're all in line. We're going to be in line there. You in there, in the camp. Yes, you. Keep going. You, you, oh, you. Over here. The guys go, oh, just because he's got a good six-pack for the abs? 
I was going to start going to the gym last month. Well, you should have fucking gone because now you're going to the camp. Don't worry. There's going to be lots of gyms in the guy camps. And that's why they're so upset. You've seen them at the rallies, right? These guys at the Trump rallies. They're like, rah, rah, rah. It's the sound of the dying dinosaur. <laughs> the signs are everywhere to them. The women are taking over. There's now more women that go to college than men. There's more women in law school than men. Whoa, no! I predict anthropologists, they will note the moment it happened when it was clear the men were on the way out and the women were on their way in and it was the Super Bowl this past year. You know, it's the halftime show. Coldplay is playing one of their nice songs. Ooh, I love you. I love you. And then Bruno Mars came on, and then that sort of confused a lot of guys watching the halftime show. Ooh, what is this? And then all of a sudden, right in the middle of Bruno's song, out comes Beyonce and 500 women in these uniforms with their fists clenched and raised and their shit-kicking boots on, taking the field. No, oh, it's like... Oh my, wait, that's our game. What's she doing here? <laughs> that's, that's where we're ending up. And guys know it. And that's why they're at the Trump rallies. That's why you hear that sound. Whoa! It's all over. It doesn't feel good. Eight years of a black president. Okay, we got through that. Now it's going to be eight years of a woman president. Oh, no! 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 No, because, no, because you know what happens after that? It's going to be eight years of the gays. We'll have a gay president. And you know what comes after that? The transgenders. <laughs> Eight years of a transgender in the White House. You're not going to know which bathroom to use. <laughs> What's left after that? After they've taken everything from us white straight guys. Oh, the animal rights people. PETA will take over the White House. <laughs> a fucking hamster is going to be running this country. <laughs> a little hamster in the Oval Office on a wheel. Send in the next congressman. <laughs> and finally, Mother Nature. There are now less boy babies being born. Mother Nature has looked at the situation, has decided that men are bad for the planet. No woman has ever built a smokestack. No woman has invented an atomic or a hydrogen bomb. And... No women, no girls go into schools and shoot them up. Not a single one of these school shootings are girls, are they? How can that be? Think about that. It's like, and it's not just school shootings. It's like women generally don't shoot you <laughs> unless you deserve it. <laughs> I mean, usually... When a woman shoots her husband or her boyfriend, some thought has gone into it. <laughs> That's actually true with most crimes. How many female arsonists are there? Or burglars? Or rapists? I mean, you go down the whole list of crimes, we're actually quite safe from 51% of the population. <laughs> right? I mean, it's like... When you... When you leave here tonight and wander out onto the dark streets of Wilmington, Ohio, it's a rough town out there, but you know, it's dark, you're on a dark street, you're just a little more aware. What are you being aware of? A woman going to jump out of the bushes and, and stab you to death? 
Is a woman going to mug you? That whatever you're afraid of does not wear a dress <laughs> or a pantsuit. <laughs> oh, man. See, but that's what you understand. You must understand the Trump voter. These are legitimate concerns. Legitimate concerns. Um, and I think, you know, I'm, we're laughing a lot about this stuff. And, and thank you, Trump voters, for letting us have a little bit of, of laughter over this. But I actually wrote something uh, today uh, while I was sitting here at the official hotel of the, uh, of the uh, Murphy uh, Theater um, and uh, the Holiday Inn Express. And... Uh, <laughs> Can I read this to you? Do you mind if I uh, just, uh, I want to, I just wrote this and I just want to, I want to read it to you. Um, and because I know a lot of people in Michigan that are planning to vote for Trump and um, they're not, uh, they don't necessarily like him that much and they don't necessarily agree with him. They're not racist and rednecks or, and they're, they're actually pretty decent people. And so I wanted to sort of, after talking to a number of them, I wanted to sort of, I wanted to write this and Donald Trump came to the Detroit Economic Club and stood there in front of the Ford Motor executives and said, if you close these factories as you're planning to do in Detroit and build them in Mexico, I'm going to put a 35% tariff on those cars when you send them back and nobody's going to buy them. It was an amazing thing to see. No politician, Republican or Democrat, had ever said anything like that to these executives. And it was music to the ears of people in Michigan and Ohio and Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, the Brexit states. <laughs> you live here in Ohio. You know what I'm talking about. Whether Trump means it or not is kind of irrelevant because he's saying the things to people who are hurting. And it's why every beaten down, nameless, forgotten working stiff who used to be part of what was called the middle class loves Trump. He is the human Molotov cocktail that they've been waiting for. The human hand grenade that they can legally throw into the system that stole their lives from them. And on November 8th, election day, although they've lost their jobs, Although they've been foreclosed on by the bank, next came the divorce, and now the wife and kids are gone. The car's been repoed. They haven't had a real vacation in years. They're stuck with the shitty Obamacare bronze plan where you can't even get a fucking Percocet. <laughs> they've essentially lost everything they had except one thing. The one thing that doesn't cost them a cent and is guaranteed to them by the American Constitution, the right to vote. They might be penniless, they might be homeless, they might be fucked over and fucked up, it doesn't matter because it's equalized on that day. A millionaire has the same number of votes as the person without a job. One. And there's more of the former middle class than there are in the millionaire class. So on November 8th, the dispossessed will walk into the voting booth, be handed a ballot, close the curtain, and take that lever or felt pen or touchscreen and put a big fucking X in the box by the name of the man who has threatened to upend and overturn the very system that has ruined their lives. Donald J. Trump. They see that the elites who ruined their lives hate Trump. Corporate America hates Trump. Wall Street hates Trump. The career politicians hate Trump. The media hates Trump after they loved him and created him and now hate him. Thank you, media. The enemy of my enemy is who I'm voting for on November 8th. Yes, on November 8th, you, Joe Blow, Steve Blow, Bob Blow, Billy Blow, Billy Bob Blow, all the blows get to go and blow up the whole goddamn system because 
It's your right. Trump's election is going to be the biggest fuck you ever recorded in human history. And it will feel good. For a day. Yeah, maybe a week. Possibly a month. And then, like the Brits, who wanted to send a message, so they voted to leave Europe. Only to find out that if you vote to leave Europe, you actually have to leave Europe. <laughs> and now they regret it. All the Ohioans, Pennsylvanians, Michiganders, and Wisconsinites of Middle England, right? They all voted to leave, and now they regret it, and over four million of them have signed a petition to have a do-over. They want another election. It ain't going to happen because you use the ballot as an anger management tool. And now you're fucked. And the rest of Europe, the rest of Europe, they're like, bye, Felicia. <laughs> so when the rightfully angry people of Ohio and Michigan and Pennsylvania and Wisconsin find out after a few months in office that President Trump wasn't going to do a damn thing for them, it'll be too late to do anything about it. But I get it. You wanted to send a message. You had righteous anger and justifiable anger. Well, message sent. Good night, America. You've just elected the last president of the United States. Good evening, Terry Hardesty reporting from our nation's capital. Donald J. Trump was sworn in today as the 45th president of the United States. I, Donald J. Trump. As some had predicted, the shit show started within minutes. Before the parade, President Trump ordered an aerial bombardment of all Mexican border towns. <laughs> the instatement of stop and frisk checkpoints at all U.S. inner cities, and the deportation of Rosie O'Donnell to American Samoa. To which Trump replied, hey, it's not really a deportation. We own the damn fat farm, for Christ's sakes. The inaugural parade finally got underway, but only after President Trump insisted on flying over the parade route in his Trump helicopter, once he learned that he was expected to get out of his limo and walk to the White House. Upon arriving, the president walked inside the 200-year-old structure, took a brief look around, and we have this exclusively, a recording made by a White House maid on her cell phone. What a jump. Look, I'm not staying here, okay? Where's the penthouse? That's more appropriate. Dad, there is a second floor. I got news for you. That's not a penthouse. You kids, you know what? You're going to live here with Pence. Hey, Pence, you move in here with, with Don Jr., Eric, and Ivanka, and run the show for me. It's going to be fantastic. I'm going to be down at the Mar-a-Lago whenever you need me. Just call. Just call me. I'll pick up your call. In other news, by day's end, 20 million Americans who say they voted for Trump had signed an online petition asking for a do-over election. Finally, this will be our last broadcast, as the new Trump channel run by Roger Ailes and Breibart News will be taking over this network and featuring all reality, all day, every day. Trump himself will be hosting the real world 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. And you're fired, America, a nightly show where your job may be next. I'm Terry Hardesty, signing off. Good luck, America. Just wanted you to see what it's going to look like. Um, so here's, here's my question. What is our problem with Hillary? What's your prob what is your problem with Hillary? You know, I mean, I, I got my problems. I can, I can, I'll tell you what my problem is with her. Uh, she voted for the Iraq War. Um, she's too cozy with Wall Street. Uh, well, those are big ones. We don't really talk about the issues, do we? Whenever they talk about Hillary, when anybody talks about Hillary, it's about 
how you like her or don't like her. And the people who don't like her, and that's on the right and the left, don't like her. But what is this about her being likable? You're not going to the voting booth to vote for a friend. I want her to be my friend. No, I don't want her to be my friend. I want her to, I want them not to like her up on Capitol Hill. I want the people she's negotiating with not to like her. You don't want somebody all likable. Sure, whatever you say. Okay, I'll sign here. What else? What are the other knocks on Hillary? Um, not trustworthy, right? We hear that a lot. She's not trustworthy. How did she prove her distrustworthiness to you? Did, did she promise to water the plants for you while you were gone and then didn't? No, I'm talking about differences. Of, I mean, you say, well, she flip-flops or whatever. Well, everybody changes. Everybody evolves. I hope they do, right? We want our Trump voter friends in here tonight. We were asking them to maybe change. If you just stay in cement... It's like, okay, so she's learned. She was against, she fought gay marriage, and then she was for it. Well, I'd rather that than staying against gay marriage. I don't think that's a bad thing. She said her Iraq war vote was wrong. She's never done anything more wrong than that. Okay, it's not exactly I'm sorry, but that's pretty, okay, it's a, she's a politician. I accept that. What else? What else? What are the other knocks on Hillary? Benghazi. Benghazi. Okay, Benghazi, Yes. She got up in the middle of the night and personally planned with ISIS, which she and Obama created, according to Trump. They invented ISIS. And they planned this attack to kill our people there at the, at the consulate in Benghazi. Six times. Oh, she's been cleared of the charges six times. That's not enough. <laughs> you have to be, if you're Hillary Clinton, you have to be cleared eight times. Oh, the Clinton Foundation. Well, thank God there's a Clinton Foundation. Look at all the good they've done. You know? I mean... And, and if what they say is true, and so they get to have a meeting with Hillary, and what's their meeting? She's still Hillary Clinton. It's not like they get to go in there and say, I need you to bomb... I need you, <laughs> I need you to bomb Yemen. Okay, how much did you give the Clinton Foundation? I gave the Clinton Foundation $50 million. Call in the airstrikes. That's not what's going on. Generally, what the Obama administration, State Department, has done, not everything, has been good for the world. The world likes us a little bit better than when George W. Bush was in the White House. Right? So... But what else? Remember, I'm not a Hillary voter, so what else? What else? Huh? You forgot to tell us she was sick. Yes, that one. She, she wouldn't tell us she had pneumonia. And I want to say something about that. I just feel bad that she didn't tell the truth about her pneumonia. And what I feel bad about is not her being a liar, but that she has got to a point in her life where she can't even trust us. She had just said, I've got pneumonia and I've got to take the weekend off. What would the response have been? It would have been, it takes a village, right? What she taught us. She can't quite trust that about the United States of America. That's a sad commentary on us. That's not really on her. Can't we start saying something nice about her? You know, even the Trump people in here, you know, or conservative people... Bernie people, can't you say something nice about Hillary Clinton? Isn't this the way we were raised? Didn't your grandmother tell you, like she told me, you can say something nice about everybody except Hitler and Matt Lauer. <laughs> Just to prove it to you, I will start off, I'll start off um, by saying something nice. I'll say th three things nice about George W. Bush. Just to prove, just to prove this can be done. All right? Number one. I think he did a good job raising those two daughters. They seem like very fine women. They seem to love their dad. Number two, uh, Bono, Bono credits Bush with breaking the log jam and getting funds for AIDS relief in Africa. That Bush put a whole bunch of money into Africa for AIDS relief. And number three, um, he loves his dogs. Yes, that's number three. He loved Bernie. Bernie loved him. 
He was so good with those dogs. Okay, there's three nice things about Bush. I've said them. So to say something nice about Hillary, we're going to start with a man. Uh, I, I filmed this uh, 17 years ago. I have a show called The Awful Truth uh, on the Bravo Network. And thank you. It was during the Lewinsky scandal and Clinton was being impeached. There was a lot of speculation that she might leave him. And we had this idea on the show that let's go out and try and find her a date. She deserves a date with a nice guy. If we have that ready in the booth, can we show them? This is 1998. We're doing an interview about Hillary Clinton being single. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, what do you think? Well, I think that Hillary Clinton's a hell of a good woman. And I hope she's not single in a year and a half. I hope they stay together, and I think they will. I think she's very committed, and I think he's very committed. You think she's, that she's not going to be out having it? You don't want to date her when she's single? No, I think that she's very happy. I hope she's very happy with her husband. And I think she understands her husband better than anybody. And I think she'll be just fine. So it's a, wow, okay. Okay. <laughs> so no dating advice? I don't want to give her any dating advice. She's going to be married to uh, our current president for a long time. All right, Joe. Thanks I hope. a lot. Okay. I'll tell her you're not interested. Tell her. Have a good time. <laughs> Bye. Well, I just left Michael, and he's a good man. Yeah. He's a good man. He's done a good job. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, have a good time. Bye. See? See, he said something nice about Hillary and me. Right? So if he can do it, you can do it. Anybody, just raise your hand. Yes, go ahead. Overqualified. She's overqualified. Is that a nice thing? <laughs> eh. Usually I'm, I used to be told that when I didn't get the job. <laughs> uh, right down here in the center. Yes, sir. Super smart. She's super smart. Over here. Hillary actually knows where Aleppo is. Hillary knows where Aleppo is. There you go. Do we have anybody, anybody from the I don't like Hillary camp that can say something nice about her? Yes, sir, in the red. She's what? She stood by her man? Yeah. How about the Mexicans up there? Trabajó en el comité de Watergate para destituir a Nixon. True. That's very true. Let's check in with our Muslims. How are they doing up there? They didn't hear your question. The drone is too loud. Okay, we'll have to get that fixed. <laughs> so, anybody else? Come on, right down here in the front row. Yes. I think she's every single thing we say we want our daughters to be. She's smart, she works hard, she's independent, and she doesn't take any shit from anybody. Wow, that was, that was beautifully put. All right, uh, right behind. Yes, sir, right back there like her ad, she really has fought for our You like her ass? <laughs> what say? Ad. Commercial. Her ads. Oh, her ads. <laughs> she really has fought for opportunity for kids for her entire life. Yes. That's very nice. All right, let me say something nice about Hillary. I'm glad she killed Vince Foster. That's another knock on her. She killed Vince Foster. White House Deputy Counsel, the Clintons had been in there for six months. All of a sudden, a Sunday morning, he's found dead in his car in a park on the Potomac River. Bullet hole in the head and a suicide note in his hand. And ever since then, how long, right, those of you who are a little older, right, how long have we had to listen to this? Since 1993 that Hillary killed Vince Foster? I hope she did. Because that's badass, man. How'd she do that? She must have jacked his car at like 8 in the morning on a Sunday before going to church. Shot him, written that suicide note, like a John Bonet type note, put that in his hand, went back to the White House for breakfast. Bill had no idea. Go on the internet tonight and type in Hillary and murderer into Google and see what comes up. Seriously, she has killed 46 people. 46 people with her own bare hands. Ladies and gentlemen, this is who I want for commander in chief. Somebody who's not afraid to kill somebody. We haven't had somebody in the Oval Office 
who has killed somebody since Ulysses S. Grant. <laughs> ISIS is going to shit <laughs> if she's president. And you know what the jihadist rule is? It's not martyrdom if you're killed by a woman. If a girl kills you, you don't go to paradise. You don't get the 72 virgins. It's like you're at a permanent high school cafeteria table all alone with the rest of the cafeteria mocking you because a girl killed you. Listen, you don't want the 70-year-old out-of-shape guy who's had nannies and servants his whole life. You want somebody who in the middle of the night, as commander-in-chief, will parachute in with Delta Force and slit the throats of a two dozen terrorists in their sleep. Yeah. Um, I got a surprise for you tonight. Um, Someone from the Trump campaign has leaked us a copy of their new ad. The diseases, she's had them all. Pneumonia, hypothyroidism, allergies, yeast infection, urinary tract discomfort, pregnancy, childbirth, time of month disorder, bleeding from wherever disease, and menopause. Do you want a commander in chief whose lady parts are out of control? Or do you want a fit, tough leader who will be the healthiest president ever? Ever! Even healthier than Teddy Roosevelt, and he was shot in the chest. Yes, there's only one candidate this year healthy enough to spawn an entire new breed of humans. Vote Trump. He never gets sick. Where I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters, okay? Now that's sick. I'm Donald Trump and I so approve this message. <laughs> Effective. I think he's going to do really well. Um, I want to tell you a little story. When I, um, I wrote my first book in 1996, it was called Downsize This, and uh, there was a chapter in there called My Forbidden Love for Hillary. And so you've probably seen these uh, different uh, photographs behind me on the stage here tonight. I was just really upset with the way she was being treated uh, when she was first lady. I mean, was she being knocked and criticized all the time? She was you know, um, being made fun of, how she looked, how she dressed, and, and also for um, being the co-president, right? Because remember when she said that they were, she was being criticized during the campaign when Bill first ran, and she said, look, I'm not some little lady going to be in the kitchen baking cookies and hosting teas. Attacks on her started then, and she was the butt of jokes of late-night comedians. I remember there was one, one joke was... Um, Hey, have you heard about the new Hillary combo at KFC? It's got two large thighs, two small breasts, and two left wings. And then I thought about it for a minute. I thought, well, that sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I just, I just, I thought she was beautiful. I, I thought she was smart. I thought she was a nice person. You know, I, I didn't understand what this was. And so I wrote this chapter called My Forbidden Love for Hillary. And I got invited to a White House dinner. And um, to give you some context for this, the dinner took place the night before Clinton's impeachment. Okay, so what a night to be there, right? He didn't look good. Um, <laughs> do we have the picture of me uh, at the White House? We found, look, there I am, there I am. <laughs> Hey, I clean up okay, right? <laughs> you go through this reception line before the dinner, and you walk into the East Room, and there's a Marine guard there who announces you. And so there's like 100 people going through the line. <laughs> so I'm standing there. And, and you're told you get five seconds, and then you got to keep moving. Shake their hands, say something nice, move on. <laughs> then the Marine goes, Mr. President and Madam First Lady, uh, Michael Moore? So I walked in there, and Bill grabs my hand, and he goes, 
Oh, my, more, I just love, I love you. I love, I'm your number one fan. I love, I love your show, TV Nation. I, love, I remember that one episode you did where you went to Idaho and, and you went to that Klan rally. Oh, that was just, and I'm thinking, what? <laughs> like, these Clintons are good, man. There's 100 people here. He's got a story for every one of them. He's referencing an obscure episode on a Friday night show on NBC of mine. And he's like, he's like, you know, and he's accurately describing the episode. And I'm thinking, man, I just, and I love, love Roger and me. I just, you're, you're, I'm your number one fan. And at that moment, Hillary grabs my hand, takes it out of his hand and says to him, no, you're not. I'm his number one fan. <laughs> and then she just, And, and she goes, I just want to say what you wrote about me in your book. I'm just, it was so wonderful. And that first line in the book, my face is turning red, right? And cause the first line in the chapter of my forbidden love for Hillary, where I have all these photos of her, uh, the first line was, Hillary Clinton, she's one hot, shit-kicking feminist babe. <laughs> and... I just, I love everything. And, w and when you talked about me on the Today Show, that just, and now at this point, her, I've been there for too long. Her aide is like stepping in because she thinks I'm holding the lineup, but it's Hillary that won't let me go. And Hillary sees the aide coming and she goes like this, shoo, shoo. <laughs> and, and I said, well, I just, listen, I just think, I'm so sorry you're going through all this. Um, with, you know, but it's, you're a good person and you seem like a good mom and, um, and, you know, you should run for Senate. <laughs> and now I, I, I could not, I went through all the files uh, trying to find this picture of her holding my hand, but there is a picture that was snapped just as I, I walked away. Okay. Check this. All right. Look at this. Look at this, that's true, this is the truth. This is true, this is all true. Look at that, one of them's really happy and one of them's not. <laughs> and that's when she took me up to the Lincoln bedroom. Uh, no, 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 nothing happened, nothing happened. I'm just saying, though, it was, it was a very special moment for me because I just felt, you know, she had been, I don't know, it was, I, her treatment was just awful. I don't, if you're young, you don't know this. If you weren't alive then, you don't know it. But the people that were alive then, you know what I'm saying, right? I'm not making this up. I'm not exaggerating it, am I? The knock on her was just, it was just awful. Last year, I was um, shooting my a movie, Where to Invade Next, and we went to this country, um, Estonia. I wanted to go there because I was trying to show in different countries, what they do better than us and what can we learn from them. And so I went to Estonia because there, but the World Health Organization says that you have the least chance as a woman dying in childbirth in Estonia than any other country on the planet. If you live in Cleveland, you have a three times greater chance of dying in childbirth than you do in, Cle than you do in Estonia. And so they took me to the maternity ward and they had the head doctor of the, the maternity ward and uh, he's showing me around, and he's telling me why they're so good at this. We're walking down this hallway, and there's a picture on the wall. And I stopped him, and I said,